name is Britt West, and I'm the Vice President and General Manager of the E&J Gallery Winery. And right there and then, you, know, you should stop and say, well, <laughs> this is about spirits, right? And true, uh, but we actually do over $500 million a year in spirits. So I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of how I think about standing out from the crowd in a large company. But I'm going to start because like a lot of these guys, uh, I was an entrepreneur, like many of you, a few years ago. And then my brand was ultimately sold to a, to a larger wine supplier. I tried to say, like, let's. There's many, many ways to be successful, um, but I, I'll talk about three that have been particularly relevant to me. One about disrupting categories. Uh, the second is about disrupting the usage occasion for our products, uh, and then lastly, just about disrupting marketing. I'll kind of end on a on a funny note with one of the projects that's literally uh, coming to fruition in the U.S. right now. So, in case you don't know, the most powerful man in the wine industry is a gentleman named Mel Dick, and he runs Southern Wine and Spirits. He runs the wine side of Southern Wine and Spirits. And when, I, when we came in, my business partners and I, we said, Mel, we, you know, we happened to know him from the industry. We said, we've got this great idea. We're going to make premium sangria. And he, he looked at me and he said, kid, I want to save you a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of headaches. You will never sell a bottle of sangria for over $7 for a 1.5 liter jug. And one could you know, be just crazy enough to walk out of there and say, oh, well, then I'll just give up and go home. But we kind of took a different approach. Because what we were looking at was, we said, the category is huge. It's a big category. It's 3.5 million cases. It all sits on the bottom shelf collecting dust. It's had no money put in marketing behind it. And two competitors have 75% market share. And we looked at that, and we kind of felt, there is an opportunity here to premiumize it because we felt it could hit on some major trends. And those major trends were really that we were aware of what the health and wellness opportunity was going on in the United States and that we could come out with a better tasting, better for you product. The second thing is we saw a clear route to distribution. And Billy, I think your, your point about route to distribution is incredibly important. If you're gonna be a health and wellness product, Having a company like Whole Foods behind you from the get-go was incredibly impactful uh, for our brand. We ultimately became the number two selling wine SKU in all of Whole Foods, not just number two selling sangria. We became the number two selling wine in all of Whole Foods by value. Uh, and in a really quick time with the help and the partnership of Southern Wine and Spirits, we became 45,000 cases and we were doubling sales volume every month. That's when operational complexity started to take over, and we realized we were things that we were good at, and there were things that we were not good at. Uh, and so when a, when a wine partner approached us to acquire the brand from us, um, Deutsch Family Wines and Spirits, a big company in the United States, they purchased the brand from us, and, uh, and it was an incredible success that had been in market for just less than 18 months. But I think the real piece of that was disrupting categories. Categories traditionally always have some piece of it. Usually it's about 10% in the US that is premium. And we saw that this category had no premium into it. So, um, so in terms of disrupting occasions, one third of all beverage alcohol is consumed during the day. And in the United States, that is dominated, dominated, dominated by the beer industry. And we've started to take a look at that and say, well, why do we allow the beer industry to have such market share of the largest of the largest occasion? Because the second largest occasion is less than half the size of the first. And so we started looking at this and kind of saying there is an opportunity, and we're not alone in looking at this, but that there was an opportunity for a highly sessionable, highly convenient, better for you, healthy alternative, less filling than beer. And that's basically what has exploded today as the hard seltzer category. Um, to give you a, a, a sense of scale of uh, what beer represents, for every 1% market share we take from beer, it represents a $1.1 billion business in the United States. But what we saw with the hard seltzer category coming into it was that while they basically look like vodka, kind of act like vodka, they're really a malt alternative to the beer industry. And so we sat down as a team at the Gallo Winery and said, could we actually produce a hard seltzer that was delivering with 
the expectations of the consumer in mind. And so with that, we introduced in May, just in time for a big summer holiday, we introduced the only hard seltzer that's made with real vodka and real juice. I can tell you the team sat and we basically thought when we did all our projections and all our analysis, we thought basically we would end up with somewhere between a 350 and a 400,000 case brand this year. I can tell you now at the end of September, we're on track to sell a million cases this year and we think we'll sell two and a half million next year. But it was having that di differentiation going into the usage occasion and seeing what a big size of prize could look like. Lastly, I just wanted to talk about disrupting the marketing. And this is one uh, of a story of knowing when your marketing is being disrupting and really capitalizing it and realizing what you're good at again and stepping away from what you're not maybe good at. Does anybody in this room know uh, what Barstool Sports is? Okay, a few. All right, so Barstool Sports is kind of a cultural phenomenon in that it's, if you are under 30 years old, every hand in this room would have been up. It is basically the ESPN, the sports channel, the sports marketing arm with a high degree of entertainment uh, for young people. Just to give you a size of how big a Barstool Sports is, it is the fastest growing publisher of sports content. It's the largest sports podcast. It's the third most viewed video creator and the 10th largest distributor media, largest distributed media company in the US right now. It is bigger than the New York Times. And we had signed on a, with a partnership to basically be the exclusive vodka advertiser on Barstool Sports. And their largest podcast is a podcast called Spittin' Chicklets. It's kind of an entertainment show. A lot of it focuses around hockey. But the two guys, one of whose name was Ryan Whitney, were on there and they were talking about, you know, how they like to drink New Amsterdam vodka. And Ryan Whitney said, you know, I'm not afraid to say it, but I drink my vodka with pink lemonade. And this kind of created an enormous kind of, you know, uh, all the guys started riffing on him and saying, you know, what kind of man drinks a pink lemonade vodka? That's ridiculous. But by following the social media channels, we started to see that Pink Whitney, hashtag Pink Whitney, was catching on. And people were posting photos of themselves drinking vodka with pink lemonade. And so we said to ourselves, well, I don't know, maybe we'll introduce a limited time offer. We introduced Pink Whitney. And we thought, literally, all right, this is probably the dumbest idea we've ever done, right? But, it, you know, it, it's, it's a limited thing. We'll just sell it to a bunch of hockey fans uh, and let them have some fun with it. We'll do pink lemonade flavored vodka. And we thought, well, if we do a limited time offer, it's a big brand in the United States. Maybe we'll sell 90,000 cases if we really push it hard. Since September, we've sold out. We are out of our 90,000 cases completely. And in my 25 years of experience, I've never, never been part of a brand, a brand like this where we have people tattooing themselves with Pink Whitney cocktails on their arm. I, there's a few U.S. distributors here in the room, so I, I'd say I got this photo here in the top left, which was a, I got a call from our head of our distributor in Florida who said, in my 35 years, I have never had consumers ever show up at our distributor warehouse thinking they could get the product faster if they just go to the warehouse versus waiting for it to get a, a retail store. We had, we had people making love declarations to my firstborn Pink Whitney baby and, uh, and, and cradling it like a child. This guy wrote about how he, he bought the last 12 bottles he could find in the entire store. We're on track to sell 300,000 cases now of it once we get back in stock by December. But it's just an example of really we don't do any of the marketing for this. What we recognized was somebody else was connecting with the consumer in a way. And what we needed to do is actually get out of the way of the marketing. That this was their area of expertise. They knew how to be culturally relevant and connect with this 20 to 30 year old consumer. And so it's turned out to be a great success by disrupting the marketing and not applying your own marketing and prowess to it. Awesome. So.